Hi, everybody. Welcome to Blockbusting, the podcast where we love to hate the movies. I'm your host, Jay Light. Joining me today, Eric Hahn. Hi. Hi. Thank you for having me. Yo, happy to have you, Eric. Yes. Eric's a wonderful, a wonderful comic and uh, one of the comics we've known for the longest here in L.A. We've known each other for a while. Wow. Yeah. Like maybe 11 years, maybe? Yeah, something like that. I think I'm just started my 11th year in comedy. I've only been in L.A. six years, but it feels like I've known you for 11 years. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> That's how deep our relationship goes. Yes. Uh, Eric has come on today to talk about a movie he hates, which is, uh, in my mind, a controversial pick, because I, I really enjoy this movie. It's Call Me By Your Name. Mm. I was on the fence about this because I guess I should state publicly uh, that I it's not like I hated the film. There were major aspects of the film that I didn't like. Very strongly, but overall, I thought it was I thought it was a good picture. Okay, you so know? You're, you're you're shitting all over your opinion right from the jump. <laughs> <laughs> well, folks, that was another episode of Blockbusting. <laughs> Can't have this. Okay, what's uh? So what's your what's your beef with it? What do you not like about it? Well, um, first off, I think that uh, the things let's let's cover what I liked about it first, okay. just to get that out of the way. Because if I don't talk about that, then then it'll kind of be in the, the back of my head. But I loved the way the movie was shot. I thought it was beautiful. Every every take of that movie was just almost like a painting. Um, I loved the pacing of the movie. I thought it was very kind of meandering, and it was very it kind of put you in a spell when mm-hmm. you were watching it. Yeah, for sure. Um, Definitely spellbinding. I loved the fact that it was a snapshot in time that we'll never see again. The whole movie, there's no cell phones anywhere. Nobody's even talking on the phone. I think there's maybe two scenes where there's a telephone call, but uh, especially in the end. But yeah, it's landline calls. Yeah. It's like old school landline calls. There's nobody sitting at the dinner table with an iPhone next to them. Nobody's talking or doing anything about social media. Everybody's just relating to one another, reading books, laying oh, around. There's, the so co- much, there's so much reading books in this movie. Yes. And you know, that was a double-edged sword for me because that's what I didn't like about the movie was that the way it made me feel afterwards. I That movie profoundly sunk me into a pit of depression for a, for a good week. Yeah? Just because of, cause of the ending? Not so much from the ending, but it just made me long for that time again. And knowing, since I was there, I mean, I was... Elio's age in the 80s like mm-hmm. I was that could have easily that character easily could have been me in 1983 I was 16 years old so I was kind of going through all of those things that a person who's coming out and kind of dealing with their sexuality I was going through those things at the time and I really felt then that I was alone that, that I was the only one You know, and of course, now with the Internet and the world being such a smaller place, that's it's ludicrous to think that way. Mm -hmm. You you know, any 16 year old, you know, with uh, a cell phone or a computer can easily find out that they're not the only gay person. There's quite a few gay people out there. So a handful for sure. (laughs) Yeah. Handful and a half. Um, Two handfuls, actually. Uh, Anyway, (laughs) that's all Eric was looking for. A couple of handfuls of gay (laughs) gifts. (laughs) <laughs> so for those of you who haven't seen it Call Me By Your Name was a movie that came out in 2017 uh, pulled from the Wikipedia page coming of age drama film directed by Luca Guadagnino uh, written by James Ivory based on the 2000 novel of the same name the chronicles are a romantic relationship between 17 year old Elio Perlman uh, played by Timothy Chalamet Tash Chalamet however you pronounce it and his professor father's 24 year old graduate student assistant Oliver Army Hammer uh, now, this movie was highly critically acclaimed. Um, it was premiered at Sundance. It got a lot of recognition for the screenplay, for the direction, for the acting and the music. Uh, it was nominated for Best Picture, one Best Adapted Screenplay, and also got 
uh, a Best Actor nomination for uh, our boy Timmy, and a Best Original Song nomination for Sufjan Stevens. Yes. And this movie, I, I do know, and this is one of my, this I will say, one of my favorite movies of last year. Wow. A really, it's a, and it put me in a place, it's very, it is very spellbinding, and it kind of, what's it, it just sucks you into its world so effectively, and the issues that I have heard about that people have with it are, A, the pacing, which, you know, that's, that's a, a thing that I tend to critique movies on, and I think that the pacing in this movie actually worked really nicely. Um, the other big thing that everybody seemed to be up in arms about, and I would love to hear your take on this, is the age difference in the relationship. Oh, yes. So th- I, I took offense to that a little bit because I don't think that it's – his character was supposed to be 24. Yes. I don't think a 24-year-old person should be having sex with a 17-year-old person. I really don't. And I think that it's a sad state of affairs that back then, and even prior to the 80s, of course, it was par for the course that a younger gay person, like 16 or 17, their first experience would be with somebody who was an adult. And I think that's sexual abuse. I don't think that a 17-year-old person should be having sex with anybody except another 17-year-old person. I really feel, especially during that time, I think that um, I think an adult person needs to be the adult and say, look, I'm not, mm-hmm. not going to mess around with a teenager. So for the sake of context, I think it would be I – I just want to hear about your – point of view about what it was like to be a, a gay person figuring out your sexuality in that time period and you know because you said you identify with Elio but it also sounds like you have had a, a different way that your your sexuality manifested itself and your coming out process was probably was I'm guessing different based on your opinion that you're you're throwing me right now so if, so if you could, just talk a little bit about that. Definitely. I mean, I think looking back, I was very fortunate. You know, the two experiences that I had uh, growing up sexually with uh, two guys that were my age at different points in my life. In fifth grade, I started messing around with this guy who was in fifth grade as well. And we kind of carried on this semi relationship with each other as much as one can. I mean, I was 12 years old, you know, this. Right. But we literally for years up until my junior year in high school kind of had an ongoing sexual relationship. So I had an outlet that was living next door to me. So I could, I could very easily explore kind of, you know, my sexual maturity at that point with, with somebody who I felt safe with. So that, that really put me on a path of like, Hey, Sex is great and everything, but sex is better with somebody who I know, somebody who who I played tennis with all day, and then we rode bikes, and then we built a Ford, and then we just so happened to, you know, blow each other. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, it's just a, you know, it's all on a day, I guess. So then the next guy that I met was uh, a year younger than me, so he was a sophomore in high school when I was a junior. We had like a year-long thing. And uh, and that was a little bit more heightened because at that point that made me realize, oh, wait a minute, there's a, there's more gay people than just my best friend next door. This mm-hmm. is a, this is a thing bigger than really what I thought it was going to be because I, I all along I always thought, well, you know, I kind of like women too, so I think maybe eventually I'll probably just you know, go with a girl and everything will be fine. That's kind of how I thought my life would unfold, you know? But then once I got that second dick, I'm like, I'm in. I'm in, baby. Send them all second my... Second time's the charm. <laughs> yeah. Just give me that dick. But I never... Pussy, ne- take it or leave it. <laughs> it's off the table. Yeah, absolutely. The thing is, too, is that even at that point, when I was 17, I graduated high school when I was 17. And I, I didn't want to go to a gay bar because... I knew that I wasn't of legal age. That's just the way I, I just felt like, you know, it's, it would be illegal for me to go there. I don't have a fake ID. I don't want to, f- met, you know what I mean? Like I just, I didn't even go to my first gay bar until I was legally able to enter the place. And then mm-hmm. when I did, 
I really was too insecure and too shy to be like, to really throw myself out there and just be like, Hey, let's mess around, you know? So it was very, it was still hard for me and challenging for me to be like a gay man because I really didn't have an idea of who I was and how to present myself. And, you know, I was still kind of discovering everything. So a lot of gay men when they're 18 and they're, I mean, they're just at the height of their beauty when you're like between 18 and 21. I mean, that's the golden years. Mm -hmm. They go the other way and they just fuck everybody, you know, and that just wasn't my experience. I just, I guess I waited until my 40s to be like a huge whore. (laughs) (laughs) See, that's the thing. So it's, it's. Interesting, and I and I kind of guessed that this might be one of the things that you would have a problem with is the age difference. Is there any is there any way that this story could have been told in a way that made more of a of an impact without being without having that element to it? Do you it, or do you think that part of the reason why the story does have such an impact is because Elio is a teenager? And when you're a teenager, you go through your emotions at a very different uh, clip than you do as you get older. Well, my thought is that at some point, the discussion had to come up on the table of like, geez, you know, uh, Army Hammer looks even older than he's 24. You know, so it's like, so we're really pushing the envelope here. But I think what they couldn't work around was the fact that their chemistry was just palpable. I mean, even for two straight men, I mean, they just seemed like glue, Mm -hmm. you know? And so I think that they would be hard-pressed to find uh, another actor that would be able to bring something to the table that would connect with one or the other at that point. Right. Um, For me, I think that the the thing that was uh, apparent, too, is that they faced no backlash. I mean, the only backlash that they kind of had was perhaps in their head because they were kind of grappling with the fact that they were gay and they perhaps quote unquote shouldn't have been, but there was no, there was no outside force that'd be like, Hey, you know, being gay is wrong. And you know, usually in these kind of tales, there's always an aspect of like doom, like, you know, Oh, you shouldn't be gay or there's, there's, but in essence, there's nothing like that in this film. If anything, it's like the dad sits down and has this weird talk with them at the end about like, hey, I kind of know you're gay. And I think his dad comes off as gay, too. His was dad was like, like, I had an experience with, a, with a, a man when I was about when I was, you know, in that age. Oh, range. my God. I was sitting in the theater going, if they make out, I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I am gone. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things that really struck me upon watching the movie was that for uh, because the movie is paced in such a way that everything kind of unfolds at this really slow clip there's a, it's, there's sort of an aspect to where the actual romance between Elio and I'm uh, Oliver sorry I, comp- I blanked on his name but the, their romance is is very much a non-factor for a really long time because it is just about their chemistry and it doesn't really it, it all all of the actual stuff with them finally hooking up and connecting and and falling for each other really happens in like the last 45 30 minutes of the movie mm-hmm. and it all happens so quick and then it burns bright and then it burns out and it, it seems kind of like a subplot almost yeah, and, it, and in essence, it, you're, you enter into the film thinking it's going to drive the film. Right. And in actuality, it's something that takes a long time getting to. And then once we get to it, 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 oh, it goes, burns, it burns quick. Mm-hmm. But it's much, more of a, it's much more of a coming of age story than a romance story. And all of that stuff is certainly evident and vital to the way the story is told, but it's not as advertised. Well... I don't know. I'm I'm not sure how they were uh, planning on advertising the film to begin with because Timothy Chalamet was – I mean obviously the guy's face is amazing and he's going to have a, a huge draw just based mm-hmm. on how his look and his fan base. You know, Army Hammer is another one too. Like his career has been so filled with fits and starts. You know, like he's oh, it's, he's going to be the next big thing and then right. we he'll don't do hear like- anything for him and then – He's got, you know, he'll do social network and everybody's like, oh, he's the next big thing. And then he does Lone Ranger and flops. Right. And nobody gives a shit about Army Hammer for a couple of years. Right. But he's, the guy is such an amazing guy. And I think that he he's very savvy. But I think that there's the forces outside.
outside of him are trying to plug him into different areas. So I, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, I think that it definitely – you can't do a gay film, quote unquote a gay film – without promoting it as a gay film mm -hmm. at this point, you know? Yeah. And uh, so I think that they, they were just like, oh, well, fuck it. We'll just put both their heads on the... At least they didn't have them, like, kissing or something, you know? At least that it was a little... Yeah, people would have not... Uh, I mean, that you can't market a movie like that, even today, which is still like a little mind-blowing, that you can have a movie that you know, hey, this movie's going to be about a gay relationship and it's marketed sort of in that vein but not really it's just you got two it's got a guy leaning on another guy's shoulder and the poster's mostly blue sky right and even the title of it when i first heard it i'm like what call me by your name mm -hmm. what what if i'm dating some guy named howard I don't want to be called Howard. <laughs> Why is that? You know what I mean? Like, don't fucking call me by your name. You, you know, like, I just didn't, I, I, I wasn't sold, you know, but then I, I kind of got it at the end, you know, but just that, that last scene mm -hmm. where they have, I mean, the director obviously loves Timothy Chalamet because yeah. I mean, he's got a full, it's like something like 13 minutes or something. Yeah. A just, close up of just his face. And then it's, it's an amazing close up too. Oh and I God. don't know. It's, it also blows my mind that that stuff on Steven songs from that take is not the one that got nominated for best original song. Right, because it's not as because the one that did is so, it sticks in your head that little that little ditty it yeah, is. Yeah, they like, kind of like bouncy. It's different. They sh they show it during a montage in the movie where they're like riding bikes in the woods and and it doesn't. But it doesn't really have the kind of emotional gravity that the actual song from that scene does. And I think part of that plays in to that performance by Tim Chalamet. You know, he, I think, is very deserving of the Best Actor nomination. And if Gary Oldman hadn't been nominated, probably would have won. Oh, yeah, for sure. The buzz was so thick for him. But I think also, along with that, I think most voters kept in mind that this guy is young, mm -hmm. super young, and he has plenty of time. He's definitely going to be... Not my generation, but your generation's like Tom Hanks. Yeah. You know, or Sean Penn or something. Like he's Yeah, he's got that kind of he's got that kind of a young Sean Penn look to him too. Yeah. I think he's got I mean he's he's got another movie up this year that he's probably gonna get an Oscar nomination for Beautiful Boy, which yes. is an addiction movie, and that looks really great with him and Steve Carell. So the story is a thing that you have a problem with of the movie. What else did you not like about this? What are the other things that really that that got you in a place where you felt weird? Um, I thought the peach scene was kind of strange. I think the they took infamous a, peach scene. <laughs> <laughs> they just took a lot of time explaining that. And I, I feel not explaining, but it just, it spent a lot more time on that than, than I think was necessary. I think that, I mean, if you're at a point in your, yeah, definitely when you're 17, you're going to stick your wiener in a watermelon or something like, it's just, you know what I mean? It's just, oh yeah. <laughs> it's I mean, true. I remember, dude, when I was reading about, I had to jack off for the first time. I was like, oh, get a banana. Everybody says, get a banana peel, put it in the microwave, get a, get a cantaloupe and cut a hole in it. <laughs> I, yeah, I definitely, I didn't hear the banana peel one, but. Oh, that's one of the, the dude, jackandworld.com. They've got all kinds of tips and tricks. Wow. <laughs> that was how I learned. God, cut to later this afternoon <laughs> at my microwave. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I like how your microwave has a keyboard in front of it also. <laughs> hey, I'm just going to let me access the internet. Oh, so wait, hold on. I put on popcorn. Oh, God. Oh, uh, wait. Popcorn setting. That's not what you don't want to stick your dick in a popcorn bag. No way. Movie no theater way. butter or otherwise, you're going to get paper cuts all over that thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, that's hilarious. I'm interested in seeing Timothy Chalamet's next film. I think that Stephen Carell looks like he's I think he's gonna own that film more than Timothy Chalamet. Mm -hmm. You know, I know I'm getting off off point here, but you I've, don't want to talk about that peach scene. Oh <laughs> It's just That's so how uncomfortable. It's just so nasty. It's like, do you really? We got now. We got sticky genitals, and you know, it's got like fruit. I think that, I think that the uh, the theme of rot to me was not lost. So you know this this idea that he's living on a peach orchard basically, mm -hmm. and that there's rot all around him. 
you know, like that's just the nature. Like peach, a peach at its peak is amazing, but two days later, it's going to be mush. Right. You know, so I think that that's another allegory that, that carries through this film. Like that's a, definitely a metaphor of like, you know, something's going to be great for just a minute, but then it's going to get really shitty, mm -hmm. you know. And there's flies all throughout this movie too. Yeah. You know, the first time I saw it, I the first fly I saw, I was just like, oh, weird. It got in the scene somehow, and they didn't really do anything about it. And then I'm like, you know, by the seventh fly that I saw, I was just like, oh, this is this is something. This is this is something. The director never explains what the flies mean, but it's got. I mean, it's got to be something subtle, especially given I didn't even pick up on the the rot stuff that you were bringing to the table now. Oh, I'm yeah. I that that to me that pervaded because I because I remember thinking too about how because I was just in that movie, man. When I was watching it, I just felt like I was in sitting at the table with them, you know. And I'm just breathing. I was thinking about breathing in all the scents that must be around them, you know. And that's kind of where I picked up on the the rotting idea of like if you're on an orchard, there's going to be, you know. To peaches rotting all around you, mm -hmm. you know? So then when the scene came up where he's actually, you know, putting one on his wiener, I'm like, oh, God. Well, they actually, and this is a, a thing that I'm reading now on the Wikipedia page, the director almost removed the peach scene. Wow. Yeah. He thought it was too explicit at first. Huh. And Tim Chalamet was also nervous about doing the scene. But then... <laughs> Uh, they each tested the method by themselves and agreed that it worked. <laughs> wow. So that's how method they went. They both were like, all right, let's try fucking a peach on our own time. <laughs> oh Make sure that it makes sense. Oh, my gosh. Because that's one of the, I would never consider having sex with a peach. No way. It just seems like you got to you got to take the pit out. You got to. I'm just rather not. Yeah, I'm just going to hold off until I have another person there. And peaches also have this whole connotation now because they're the butt emoji. Exactly. That's this whole thing. <laughs> so it's like, okay, yeah. So it's very, it feels oh. almost more on the nose, sort of retroactively. Like, they, of course, this is set in the 80s. They don't know what an emoji is at all. No way. They don't even know what cell phones are. No. They don't know. They don't know anything. They probably. They, they certainly don't know what the internet is. They don't know about JackandWorld.com in the eighties. Oh my gosh! That's still locked up between whatever government organizations were uh, figuring out the internet. And now we uh, we have it summed up with just one little icon, one little peach icon. We know what we're talking about. The butt. We know it's about that butt. Uh -huh. About that peach. <laughs> so there's other things in this movie that were taken out in the draft as well. And this is. And this is sort of playing into my idea that the the romance sort of becomes a subplot of the fact that it is between two gay men. The there's originally voiceover narration from Tim Chalamet's character. Wow. And there was a lot of nudity in the original draft of the script. I would have liked the nudity actually. Well, of course, they're playing right into your brand. <laughs> Just want to see some naked men. But they uh they got rid of it. Uh, they they dropped it. They wanted to try and film it, but they, they just couldn't figure out how to do it right, and they didn't want to have the story told retroactively as it was happening because it eliminates the surprise of and of that last 30 minutes or so of the movie. Right. Where everything happens and then goes away. And it does take... Once, once you start seeing actual sexual things and they're, you know, they're both naked, it takes on a different... I think that that was probably a wise choice for him, even though I think, you know, I'm hoping hopefully in the director's cut, we'll see some something. But <laughs> Well, there's going to be a sequel, so you never know. You might be able to see uh, call, call Me In Again by Your Name. <laughs> I didn't know there was going to be a sequel. Oh, yeah. There's uh, the film sequel to the film in 2020 that would be telling the story of them as they age. And it would film them at the time. So it would be uh, Timothy is a 25-year-old. So Elio is 25. And Oliver, 15 years later. So he'd be in his late 30s, 39. Wow. It would be set during the 90s also. So you get to see a whole bunch of other political stuff and stuff, more stuff happening in Italy and Iraq is going on, the first Gulf War. So it could happen. Oh, actually, hold on. Here we go. The sequel is going to be set right after the fall of the Berlin Wall, and the great shift was the end of the USSR. <laughs> so this is Luca on on deck. 
I just I don't know if that's a I don't know if that's a good move. I'm with all, I'm. I don't think it needs a sequel. No, I think it captured a time, and it it was a perfect little snapshot of what that was mm-hmm. like. But to carry that forward kind of loses it loses the sizzle. I think that you know Timothy Chalamet was so good at showing how all of that shit percolates within a young person. You know, mm-hmm. you could see it. Like in his, even in his intense, quiet moments, you could tell that there was a lot roiling underneath there, you know, of like, that's, that's how you are when you're, you know, 18. But then you get up into your 20s, 25, you're, I mean, it's a different kind of ball game, you know? Right. The thing that struck me and, and made me really enjoy the movie is that it does capture the essence and the feeling and the vibe of falling in love with somebody for the first time. Because that first love is a very different kind of love than anyone will ever experience again. You know, I've been, uh, the first, the first girl I fell in love with was high school girlfriend and same deal as this. We, we dated for longer. It wasn't a summer, it wasn't a summer fling like what Elio and Oliver had, but it burned bright and then it it burned out very quickly. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of very negative emotional fallout that I had to deal with. And there was a lot of like. There were a lot of times of it, it, it didn't even think about this. I definitely cried in front of a fire after we broke up one night. <laughs> I came, I remember coming home, me and we had just broken up for like for good because we did the off and on thing for a little bit. And I, we'd broken up for good and I came home and I was at a party and it was like f- four in the morning and my mom was awake and I just like went to her on the couch and I was just like, it's over. And there was a fire and there was a fire in the living room and I was crying. Oh. But you can't capture a feeling like that without the kind of care that Luca put into directing this movie. Oh, yeah. So that's a thing that I think that the movie does really well. And if you are, for whatever reason, if you're skittish about seeing a gay romance and you don't know if you're going to identify with it, that's why I would encourage anyone to go watch this movie. For sure. Because it's not about – it's more about the, the time mm-hmm. and the age of the, you know, of the main character. You know, what he's going through. Yeah. Is there anything else that you were really turned off by in the movie that you feel uh, detracted from your experience of watching it and being able to to sink in and enjoy it as much as you did? Um, I thought it was interesting that they had him kind of have this quasi-sexual relationship with that girl, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, she was kind of annoying. <laughs> oh yeah you know what i mean like she just was kind of like eh. i would have liked to have seen her a little bit more likable you know like to me like i just felt that her character just k- kind of came off uh in a real negative way but perhaps that was not his intention but that's how it struck me you know uh but and i i think that uh the relationship with his mom i think could have been fleshed out a little bit more for me for my because i'm always drawn to relationships with women more so than men. So maybe maybe that's one of the things that didn't settle right with me in, in the end was the, the fact that the father was so open and loving. I think maybe I resented that because I totally didn't have that kind of dad at all. Yeah. You know, and I think my dad messed around with dudes too, like when he was younger. But he, you know, I think that he made my life hell. Like, <sighs> Well, that's the difference when you get people who've been in Europe versus Americans. If this story was told in America, it would have had all of that as an undercurrent through the whole thing. And the backlash that you mentioned not existing in this movie really would have been such a stronger theme. But I also think that if that was there, it also would have taken away from the impact of the movie too. For sure. Because then it becomes about a forbidden love and then it has this other message to it that I don't think was ultimately what it was the the movie was trying to say. Right, because it made it more pure. Mm -hmm. You know, I think with the idea of a forbidden love, you know, takes it in a direction of like there's a certain kind of heat that comes with forbidden. I think that that's why Americans kind of retain this idea of shame and sex is because the shame keeps it hot. You know, the shame is, you know what I mean? Yeah, Which I is do. perverse. And I don't, I don't like this idea, but it's true. You know, I think that people are drawn to something they feel like they shouldn't be doing, mm-hmm. you know, For so sure. that's what makes this, you know, the idea of gay sex, like hot and appealing, you know, which is awful. I think that, you know, 
But I, I've said before on stage, I'm like, I, I'm glad shame is coming back. It's going to keep, it's going to keep the sizzle and sex. You yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> oh, you need a little, you need a little bit of shame to keep things going. Absolutely. Absolutely. Keep it spicy. Yeah. <laughs> shame is, shame is like hot sauce. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Just a little bit, just a little, you know, maybe pour it on sometimes. And I always carry a little bit with me at all times. I always have a little shame in <laughs> oh, my oh, bag. I got, you got shame in your bag. Swag. <laughs> like Beyonce. Yeah. Beyonce. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. Oh, man. Uh, okay. So if there were any things, is there anything else that you might change about this movie? Or do you think it works as it is, even though there are flaws? I, th- I would like to see... Uh, I think it would have been a different take if the Army Hammer character was actually looked a little younger. Like it just like a little closer to the age of the main character because then it would seem like because a 24-year-old person should know better than to be messing around with a 17-year-old. I just really feel like, you know, if I had kids, I would not want my 17-year-old son to be having sex with a 24-year-old person. I really don't want that. Yeah. I think a 24 year old is a, a different in a different place in a different time, you know, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of those things I had the, the same girl that I was mentioning earlier, my high school girlfriend, she, while we were together, had sex with a guy who she worked with, who was in his, I think late twenties and in Texas. And I think in much of the United States, despite the age of consent being, 16 and I don't know if it's still 16 but it was 16 at the time despite the age of consent being 16 and she was of age technically there is also this other law that you have to be within a 10 year age gap for that to still be legal and he was outside of that gap wow. and so he was and I remember she told me about all this after the fact and he was under he had she had to you know she her mom got a call from the cops that was like, hey, this thing happened. We're investigating it. Wow. Yeah, he's a, he's a criminal. Yeah. It's, it's technically it's criminal behavior in some places. Absolutely. And I, I don't care I, if you're, an, if you're adult, an adult and you're being sexual with people, you have to be careful. You have to be mindful of things like that. There's no, ex- there's no excuse of like, hey, I didn't know. Or, hey, she told me she was 18. No, it's your responsibility. Mm-hmm. You know, and these this idea of like, well, they're they're mature beyond their years and they're, you know, well, she looks like she's 19, but she's really 16. It's like that doesn't matter. It's like I I would not want to be sexual with somebody that that's at that age because I don't want to have that kind of impact on somebody. I don't want them. This is one of the reasons why I would never mess around with somebody who is like a 17 year old, because I don't want them to go into adulthood knowing that they slept with some guy in his forties when they were a teenager. That's fucking gross. Yeah. There's plenty of other guys my age that, that I don't have to check their IDs. Yeah. And I'll have a perfectly fine time. And the thing is, no matter what, even if that experience is consensual, it still is going to affect you in a certain way and color the way that you look at sex, the way as you, as you grow up. And that's something that I don't think people should have to, that's a burden that people shouldn't have to bear. And I'm really glad that you didn't have, that you were able to have experiences with people your own age and that it was healthy and you didn't have to deal with, with people in, I mean, in a sense being predatory. Me too. Me too. Even though I look back on pictures and man, I, I'm like, wow, I was pretty yummy. Uh, <laughs> and I, I mean, it's the gold mirrors, you know, <laughs> I remember specifically, there was one guy that was uh, kind of following me around to Kmart when I was like, I don't know, 13 or something. I was shopping with my mom and I just, man, it just that felt so creepy. This guy's eyes, I'll never forget the way he looked at me and the way he just seemed to pop up everywhere I was in the store. And I just, it just immediately clicked with me that. That, that somehow this guy wanted something from me that I really wasn't really able to give him at that point. You right. know? And, uh, and that was really frightening to me. So I can't imagine if that, if that guy would have approached me or something, I, I, just, I would not have been comfortable with that at all. Now, a lot of my contemporaries have experiences where they were completely fine with that. They were right. like, you know, and if, if that's worked for them, that's fine. You know? But I, I, 
I'm just not of the, I'm not cut from that cloth. I just can't do it. You know, even though I talk, I talk all big and everything like, Oh, I'm this huge slut. But back then I was very conservative. You know, I felt like, you know, yeah, I, you've, you've had your slut awakening. Yeah. It's I, yeah. Now it's like, fuck it. I'm 50, but I'm going to fuck anybody. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first folks. Eric will fuck anybody. <laughs> Um, but not a peach, not a no <laughs> fruits of any kind or vegetables for that matter. <laughs> uh, is there any movie that you would recommend people watch? Maybe not. I wouldn't say instead of because you did seem you did sound like you enjoyed calling by your name. But is there another movie that you think captures it, it, it captures uh, this experience and the and the sort of vibe of like falling in love and and being drawn in and and does it in a way that doesn't. Th- feel as flawed as call me by your name does hmm with the same kind of theme like a like a love type theme yeah (sighs) it's typically not the kind of movie i'm drawn to honestly yeah yeah i'm not drawn to like i'm I'm kind of struggling to think of any type love type story well then let's go hyper broad what's your favorite gay movie oh my favorite gay movie is gray gardens (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> which we were originally going to talk about. Then you told me, oh, wait, this is a movie you're supposed to not like. Yes. Grey Gardens is amazing. It's absolutely required viewing if you're planning on being a gay person or planning on being a regular gay person. You absolutely have to watch this movie. It's incredible. It's a documentary shot in the 70s, very low res, very – but it's about relationships and it's about – and it is kind of a love story between a mother and a daughter. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they're they within the realms of their mental illness and they're dealing with hoarding issues and living in this decaying mansion in the East Hamptons. And uh, there's connections to the Kennedys, which the Kennedys is like American royalty. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and it's another snapshot in time where it's just – it's an incredible movie, and I, I recommend everybody watch Grey Gardens. And you, you, I've seen it over and over again. And when I watch it, I, I feel like I'm visiting friends. I feel that close to those characters. I really do. I have to watch it. I was supposed to watch it for school, and then I had to miss that screening many years ago. So one of these days, I think it's on HBO. I'll give it a look. Yeah, do yourself a favor. Watch it. Don't watch the Drew Barrymore remake, which... No, I want to see the real deal. Yeah, the real deal. I want to see Lil like, Edie. Oh, my God. I love her. I love her. I, t- I memorize lines from the movie. It's just – it's it's an incredible uh, incredible piece of film. Well, Eric, thanks so much for coming on today, man. This is a really fascinating episode. I'm glad to, I got to hear your perspective on this and, and you're so open and, and willing to share all your – all your knowledge. Well, I'm so grateful that you had me, and I uh, I wish I was funnier, but <laughs> it's okay. We had our funny moments. Yeah, I love talking to you. That's why I I definitely wanted to do this podcast, just because it, it gave me a chance to spend some time with you. Because I just think that you're funny and you're engaging, and you just have such an amazing spirit and uh, and an incredible ass. I thank you. <laughs> hey, well, I do the squats. I make it work. It's working. <laughs> Uh, where can the listeners find you on the internet? I'm at uh, Eric Hahn Comedy uh, on Instagram and uh, at Eric Hahn on Twitter. Nice. And you can find me at Diet J on Twitter and Instagram, jlightcomedy.com for show dates. And uh, please go ahead and leave a rating and review and on iTunes and let's bump ourselves up past what – I haven't checked in on iTunes in a minute. Let's see what, what kind of podcasts are beating me out this week, huh? <laughs> Here's a, a thing that really bugs me that is currently beating me on the <laughs> on the podcast front. Judd Apatow's Funny People Podcast. Uh. A <laughs> podcast that came out in 2009. Oh. <laughs> Still is beating me on the iTunes charts. We got to we got to fix that. Oh. So leave a rating and review and let's get some people to uh tune into this and not about a movie that came out almost 10 years ago. <laughs> Uh, guys, this has been Blockbusting. Go see something good for a change. Okay.